Get your tissues ready, guys. It's the final episode of Season 1. On the show, we're chatting all things crypto with Chloe Diamond. If you don't know your NFTs from your Bitcoin or bats from your hashing, we chat openly about it and the implications for our industry. It's a really interesting chat, so grab a drink, make yourself comfortable, and enjoy. <laughs> we're on. We're live. Go, 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 go. It's the final episode. Boom. Shit. Boom. Episode oh, 30. we're starting with a rant. <laughs> yeah, right. So, let's talk about uh, let's talk about blockchain and NFTs, Greg. Because let's be, let's be honest with the listeners here. I understand the that blockchain is going to be technologically important for a lot of companies, but I do think NFTs are a bit. I don't know, like flash in the pan. It feels a little bit like there's a lot of people spending a huge amount of money on something that technically doesn't exist. It's a bit of a gold rush. bit of a gold rush. But I know mm. you've taken a keener interest in it than I have. Well, not. I mean, I've not, I've not produced any NFTs. I've not tokenized anything or, or whatever you call it, certified anything. Um, obviously, we'll get into this in, in, in the podcast, but... Um, I think it is, yeah, it probably is a bit of a flash in the pan, but it's also kind of an interesting, exciting space. Um, and these things kind of have historically always popped up. You know, there's been fads, there's been phases, there's been, you know, uh, runs on markets. You go back to the kind of the first kind of bubble, which was to do with tulip bulbs in the Netherlands in the 16 or 1700s, from what I remember, first kind of major oh, run you, on I, something. I, are you that old? <laughs> I do remember it. Um, <laughs> it's a weird Dutch accent. <laughs> yes, uh, oh, oh God. I'm not even going to try. I'm not even going to try. I just sound like Sean Connery if I try and do a Dutch accent. Um, yeah, so no, I think it's it's a definitely an interesting space. And yeah, let's be honest, neither of us know much about it. But that's that's a good space to start, you know, because we want to we wanna be... The listener in this situation and we've got a fantastic um person on to talk about that but that that will all come a little bit later we're not gonna get away with uh doing the intro without pointing out the fact that tom you've bought another oh, new camera system i do you know what i i said i said to you i was like let's not discuss it we'll not discuss it in this season maybe we kick off season two <laughs> But yes. It's all right because you've told your wife now. So we can just Yeah, she she knows she knows now. Yeah. That was that was a that was a thing. So uh yeah, I have yeah, so I mean obviously avid listeners to the show will know that I have gone from Canon to Nikon, Nikon to Canon, Canon to Mamiya Leaf, Mamiya Leaf to Canon, Canon to Phase One, Phase One to Fujifilm, Fujifilm to Leica, Leica to Sony, Sony to Canon. In two years. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, in just the lifespan of this podcast, you've gone through three camera systems. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's pretty bad, isn't it? So what so, are you now um, Canon. Canon R5s, I, are they? I have, yeah, Canon R5s. I have ended up back where I started. Mm. I left, when I started this journey, I was on the Canon 5DS which is more camera than any of us pretty much need still to this day. Having done all these changes, you're basically could, like a you're basically wandering around like a man with one one shorter leg than the other. <laughs> You've just done a massive circle. It it's been a catastrophic waste of time and money. But the R5 wasn't out when you started. Well, this is it. I've mo- I've moved every time a new system bought something in. That's why I've moved. Hmm. And actually, if I just hold on a couple of years and the R5 had come out, I could have saved myself a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of hassle. So hmm. if you're thinking about doing system changes, don't bother. It's a waste <laughs> of money. I I feel like I have single-handedly propped up the camera industry in the world at this point. Yeah. I've spent so much money. Yeah. So it's oh, been well. miserable. But at least you're I'm, familiar with them all. Well, if anyone wants any tech advice, I've used every single one. Um, <laughs> Don't advertise that; you'll be bombarded with questions. On I've Instagram. N- please uh, the amount the amount of emails I get from you wonderful people. I I don't know how to answer them all. <laughs> <laughs> Bluntly, 
It's nice to you hear do, from you do, but you can't you can't say it on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean I'm just I'm just we're all quite busy, really, aren't we? So it's look the thing is about the Canon is actually it is the best one I've used out of the bunch. It's phenomenal. The I love the files; they're great to work with. I love using it. I, I was Canon pretty much my entire career until I started doing all these silly moves, and actually the Canon R5 just kind of feels. Okay, like but what, Nick, what nickels you? <laughs> there must I mean, be bits. Look, what do there's you have a, better? There's always going to be things that are wrong with any system. Hmm. For example, and this is quite a big one for me, when you're shooting tethered, it doesn't give you the option, doesn't, yeah. sorry, it doesn't give you the option of saving the images to card as well as sending it to the laptop. Mm. That, to me, is a great feature. Because you, if you're if you're backing up to card as well as shooting tethered, you've then got within seconds of pressing the shutter, you've got three copies of the data. The Canon five D Mark threes don't do that either, though, do they? Canon don't do it in general, and I think yeah. it's to something to do with how they bypass the camera, the camera's card's buffer, and it basically because mm. if you're shooting tethered, you only get even if you've got the image preview, uh, image review to come on, it only comes mm. on for a split second. And then it just goes mm. straight away. So it's something to do with the image, how it's stored on the camera as it transmits. Do so um, you think that's, that's something they could bring in, though, as an option? Or is it something that uh, just will never come to the R5? Have, having now used all of the cameras by all of the uh, manufacturers, there are very few who actually tend to listen to us. And mm. as you say, it was it was a thing on the, on the Mark III. Mm. And as a result, I don't think it'll probably... I yeah. don't see the. I don't. I think they don't see the value in it. I find it deeply annoying because it's it. You, as much as I hate chimping, sometimes it's useful just to, because it's right there in front of you, rather than having to turn around and look at your laptop that might be a couple of foot away from you. You don't even need to chimp now because it's because it's mirrorless. Yeah, you I can guess just, You can just exactly have it. Have well, the image review. What if? Okay, so you're using. Yeah, I was going to say, what if you're using flash? Obviously, with EDF, yeah. it's going to review for a second in the screen before it exactly. goes. Exactly, and then I, I just, I just slow down my shooting speed. So actually, they just think I'm a bit. To only slower. 19 frames per second. I mean, 25 at a push. <laughs> but you know, you, you, you slow it, you slow it down. Yeah. So you're getting the images, and you kind of go, well, okay, I, I know exactly where this shoot's going. Yeah. Um, what I would say is that it took me a little bit of time, and you know, I've got a studio set up in the back of the house to match the EVF to the screen to my laptop. So now, obviously, right. what when when I take an image in the viewfinder, I know exactly that it will look the same on the back screen, and then when it transmits to the laptop as well, because mm -hmm. um, obviously, you know, trying to balance images on multiple screens is a nightmare so if you can just try and make everything look as similar as possible because there is no calibration for this sort of thing no but surely you just need all the you need the data there on the camera that's what you're worried about when you're shooting and then because you're sure, putting a style on it right sure but the 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 trouble is i guess uh with your viewfinder for example it's a smaller screen the contrast might look a bit higher yeah, so true. then if you're if you're trying to gauge where you're where you're positioning your softbox for example you're trying to gauge shadow if the contrast yeah. is too punchy on the viewfinder, it's going to look like the shadow is way more than yeah, it is, and then you might flatten it off and then look on the laptop and you'd be like, oh, damn, that's a bit softer you know, than I was hoping for. An issue I always had with, um, with cameras is when you, when you are looking on the, on the back of the screen, it is a contrasty, punchy image, and you're like, well, there's not much, there's not much you know, detail there, and then you look at it on the monitor and you're like, well, actually, there's loads there. Mm. But at the time, you have a little panic. That is what um, I like about the Canons. Is obviously their picture profiles are some of the best from any of the manufacturers because you can mm. dial in. You know, say for example, you you have it set as the portrait setting. You can then dial in the amount of contrast, the sharpness, the the saturation. You know, mm. and they're and actually they're pretty nice. Those mm. those ones that you can when you found the one or oh, kind of dialed it into where you want it to be, they're pretty good. And it, you know, obviously, like you say, you're not you're not getting the final representation because obviously you want to look on the laptop. Um, but it's it's a fairly decent, accurate representation. But long story yeah. short, I've wasted so so much money and been so miserable for a couple of years not being happy with what I'm using that I'm actually chuffed to bits and thrilled now that Good. I've moved to Canon. It's quite expensive. Hmm. 
Oh, well, but, I'm, I'm I'm intrigued. I'm gonna I'm gonna watch the space, see how you get on with it, because you know I do shoot cannon, and I'm still tossing up what my next move is going to be, whether or not it's going to be the Fuji X, uh, you know, your GFX 100S, which is probably overkill for 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 some jobs, or whether or not I go down the R5 route. Well, what I will say is that the R5, having used a Fuji film GFX 100, not the S, the files are amazing, actually. Mm. The, the files are truly incredible, but they're huge. Yeah. You know, I, I am now working on the R5 files, and I'm using 16-bit PSDs with compression on, and they are running a full frequency separation and then running them back into Capture One for my grading, and the files are 1.2 gig each. Whereas before, when I was using the Fuji files, I was having to work on PSBs because they were over 4 gig in size. So, up to you. Because the thing hmm. is now, I think 45 megapixels is enough for anything. Because we've got super resolution in Photoshop. Yeah, true. true. I just I just don't see the need for more. Hmm. <laughs> and yet... <laughs> I will probably anyway. sell all this next week and get the, G, <laughs> the, the GFX 300S when it, when it comes out. Oh, you dear. wait till they bring out the gigapixel camera. One shot. I'm into it. Well, this, Thousand this megapixels. Is, this is why this is going to be a seamless segue. By the way, Tom, this is why you know when you're shooting tethered, you need to have somewhere to put your massive SSD hard drive Damn. plugged into the back of your laptop. <laughs> yeah, Damn, you son. You? that was a seamless smooth. segue. <laughs> seamless, <So smooth. laughs> which brings us to uh, well, you know, we have five lucky winners this week to we celebrate. Do. The end of season one. Um, they are. Shall I announce them? Yes. They are. Tom Barnes. Tom Barnes. Tom. <laughs> Congratulations! I can't believe it. <laughs> Certainly saves okay. on postage cost. <laughs> How many times did you enter? Quite a few. Uh, no, I am going to read off the names now. And obviously, if you are listening, um, please get in touch and let us know where you would like your device sent in the UK um, and it is something we'll be doing in the coming weeks um, so congratulations to Sarah Lucy Brown um, congratulations to John Payne Guy Robertson Matt Beach and Paul Reich I think that's how I say your name Paul um, yeah congratulations guys um, send us a DM on Instagram or an email we should probably say what the competition was for in case people are just picking this up well, if they're just picking it up, they can sod them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this was, I mean, you guys are the lucky winners of a Joey pouch. Um, so big shout out to uh, Joey underscore safe on Instagram. If mm -hmm. you want to go check them out. Um, they are a fantastic little uh, neoprene pouch that sticks on the back of your laptop and gives you somewhere to stash your hard drive. Um I was kind of sceptical at first. I looked at it and thought, well, do I need that? You know, is it something I'm going to be that useful? And I have to say, I've used it on a couple of shoots and it's been really good because when you pack down the computer, there's no danger of you losing the hard drive. You can unplug it and leave it in the pouch and mm -hmm. then put the computer straight into your backpack and you've you've got it there. And obviously, you know, if you're shooting to two hard drives or you're backing up to a third hard drive, then put that somewhere else because there'd be no point if you got it all together as tom as tom would say in previous mm. episodes um but yeah i found it to be super super useful so uh well done guys thank you for entering and um hopefully you will be getting your little bundle of joy in the uh, in the post um but yeah now that we've done that i mean obviously this is our final episode so i don't want to get emotional or anything <laughs> Oh, that's laughter. Yeah, Correct. I was going to say, that's the sound of Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Laughing or crying? Um, um, yeah, well, how do you want to do this? How do you want to... Don't know, well, man. Like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> this Cheers, is, guys. by the way, these are unscripted. I don't know if you can tell. Yeah. We're, the, um, you know, we're, we're 30 episodes in now, and, you know, it's been quite fun. It has. It's been an education. Um, <laughs> we've had some fantastic guests so I guess at this point I, we should probably thank our guests because without them we wouldn't have had a show um, you know they've well, we given up we, time we would have had a show it would have just been me and you ranting 
yeah true and no one would have listened exactly um, so thank you very much to the guests for breaking that up and actually making it listenable bring some quality content yeah um <laughs> Yeah, it's been it's been amazing to have you all on. Um, you've you've all been fantastic. Um, we do have plans to come back, and we have got some incredible guests lined up for season two. Uh, season two does hinge on a few things. Um, we do require sponsorship to be able to come back. So, you know, if any of you are listening to the show and you think this is actually probably worth putting a little bit of money towards, and we can have our product on the intro, then um, get in touch. Um, and yeah, we're 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 hoping to bring back season two, but but for now, thank you. <laughs> should we just jump in? We've got a fantastic guest this week, so you know we should probably just stop rambling. This is this is this episode is basically looking in to the future. This week on the show, we are incredibly excited to be joined by Chloe Diamond. Chloe is the CMO at Swash, which is a data monetization uh, solution, and well curator at Mokta, which is the Museum of Ke- Contemporary Digital Art. Um, Chloe's here today to talk to us about all things NFT and blockchain and all these kind of digital complicated things that myself and Tom are kind of wading around in without much prior knowledge so chloe thank you for coming on the show and kind of helping us understand these things <laughs> yeah thank you so much for having me i'm excited to be here so i mean to start with let's let's drill down a little bit into you um kind of a bit of an introduction on, onto your background and and how you kind of have uh, have started and, and what you do with tell us a bit about swash and about mokda and everything else Sure. So, um, I mean, I personally have been around the blockchain space since about 2014, just by chance. Um, I was living in Eastern Europe and in Georgia specifically, and they were mining a lot of Bitcoin uh, at the time. I'm not sure if they still are. And I just kept hearing about this thing and I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I didn't really think much more of it at the time. Um, And then it was about 2017 when I think we all sort of caught on, there was like this big ICO boom, which is like the initial coin offerings. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that was when Bitcoin sort of started to get into mainstream discussions. Um, And I actually at that time started working with an agency based in the US where we were talking, uh, sort of doing marketing solutions for different blockchain companies. So across different sectors, including art and antiques, real estate, uh, energy, pretty much like any area, gaming as well. Um, And then thinking about how blockchain applies to their solution. So a lot of the time we're sort of taking existing companies and working with them and seeing how blockchain could kind of help their industry. And Mm -hmm. because of that, I actually, uh, that sort of got me started thinking about NFTs really early. But I didn't really think much more of it at that time, except it just being a another application of this really exciting technology. So um, yeah, fast forward a few years, I finished my degree. Um, I should also add, actually, I was working doing this while in the evening I was studying history of art. So I was always kind of tech by day, art by night, and didn't really see that those worlds would come together until mm-hmm. the end of my degree. Uh, where I ended up doing my dissertation on a blockchain artwork by Kevin A. Bosch uh, called I Am A Coin. And that was a really exciting twist for me because it was really like, this is a very interesting revolutionary way of using this technology. And it really kind of got my brain juices flowing. Mm -hmm. Um, And that sort of led me to start working with Mokta and also I guess reinvigorated my interest in blockchain as a whole. Um, I really enjoyed working with the agency before, but I think there's a cert- there was a certain culture around the blockchain and crypto space which felt a little bit exclusionary and wasn't that easy to be a part of at the time. Mm. But since then, I think it's really grown and matured and you have so many different voices there now which are just um, making very interesting and bringing those different perspectives into it. So, So yeah, with Swash, what I'm doing now um it's it has again that kind of i guess the social element to it which is what i think was lacking before in the blockchain space and actually has like a front-facing application that has a real sort of practical use for everyday people 
whereas mm-hmm. I think a lot of other other examples tended to be quite very technical or sort of more on the back end and there wasn't that sort of tangible aspect to it. Uh, so what Swash does in its current form, it's a browser plugin which captures data, pulls it together and then sells it on behalf of the people whose data has been captured. And then once that data is sold, 70% of the profits are redistributed back to those people. So this is something that's happening already in the sense of whenever we're using the internet or any other devices, our data is being collected and captured mostly without our knowing. I'm sure we sort of know it's happening now because of things like GDPR, but we're not really aware of what that is, what it looks like, what it's being used for. Mm -hmm. Um, And pretty much we're hoping that because at the moment that industry is happening and there's literally trillions of dollars of profit flying around built on other people's value that that has been contributed by them, whereas they don't receive anything for it, um, we're hoping to rebalance that power and bring that back to people so they can first receive some some of that value back and also to um, to sort of have a better understanding of how this data economy is working to make sure that as we're going forwards, it actually has, a, I guess, like a more sustainable and self-aware approach as it grows, because it's something mm-hmm. that is growing whether we like it or not. Sure. I, I realized mm-hmm. quite quickly then that we'd probably should have started more with a definition of blockchain and yeah, what, NFT. What is, what is blockchain, right? <laughs> because obviously, I think, if speaking for myself, it's something that has only really kind of started to appear in the last kind of couple of years, and I still can't really get my head around a lot of aspects of it. And I, I'm sure there are some of our listeners who are the same. So just a, a simple explanation of what blockchain is and then we'll move on to nfts yeah sure so i guess in a very simple way blockchain is a way to store and process information um, on many different computers rather than just one centralized place Um, this means that it's a distributed network um, and everyone can see what's going on there so it's more trusted than if you're to rely on one centralized authority Um, And it also allows people to make transactions directly between individuals rather than having to go through an intermediary like a bank, um, which is what we see with the likes of Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, And with the blockchain, everyone can see and verify what's happening and agree to it. And that then creates this record which can't be changed. Um, NFTs, on the other hand, are a little bit of a jump from this because they they're using blockchain technology and they're basically a sort of digital collectible that uh, have really, I guess, sparked now because they make this idea of digital scarcity possible. So um, they really emerged in 2017, 2018 with the likes of CryptoKitties and CryptoPunks, which basically work like limited editions or collectibles like Pokemon cards and memorabilia and things like that. So um, when you actually have an NFT and you purchase an NFT, for example, you're technically buying the digital certificate that says that you own that particular file or tweet or whatever it is. Um, It doesn't mean that other people can't copy or download or or share, but they can um, they can see that you are the original owner or they can see, for example, the ownership history of it or even be able to trace back to who was the original person who minted or created that particular NFT. So it's sort of, in that sense, it addresses some very old problems of authorship, which we find Mm -hmm. in in fine art and in other industries as well. Um, But that being said, there are of course still areas which, because it's so new, there are a lot of things that haven't quite been ironed out or or clarified yet. But that's what makes it fun. (laughs) So... When we're talking about NFTs, obviously, for anyone who doesn't know, they're non-fungible tokens, right? Yes. Now, here's me playing devil's advocate, because I actually, I think it's a very exciting technology. I think it's a very exciting thing. I have tried to follow blockchain. I work with a lot of tech companies who actually sell blockchain technology as part of their, as part of their portfolio. Um, the thing that gets me is 
if I go to the bank and I have £10,000 in the bank, history and tradition states that that is then backed, or the amount of money that is in, in circulation is backed by gold in Fort Knox in America. Or, actually, I don't even know where the UK... The, the treasury i guess the mint no where's where's our gold store we're not on the gold stand anymore are we but we used to hmm. so the, the thing is it used to be you know you say for example you had ten thousand pounds in the bank you had you could go and physically pull out ten thousand pounds with things like nfts it's not a tangible item so where is is the worth created by it purely being an NFT, because the the issue that I've got with them, right, is, is this it, with NFTs or with crypto? Well, it could be it could be kind of both, really. Because the thing is, nothing crypto doesn't exist as much as an NFT doesn't exist. There's no not backed. I know they exist, but they don't. They're not backed by anything physical. You know, if gold is obviously backed by gold, uh, you know, the Bitcoin isn't backed by anything other than the ledger that it is slowly being created is that is that right yes i think that's correct but i guess you could argue the same thing with our existing currencies now because i mean we haven't been pegged to the gold standard since like the 1970s now so really what is the value of dollar or pound or euro actually determined by um, sure. and i think the the thing that comes into that discussion as well is that the idea of scarcity is really important because of course when you've got things like bitcoin um and why people are so excited about it is because it's programmed the, like that's all you get they can't suddenly mint any more or create any more or print any more money mm -hmm. um and i think that's a that well that's revolutionary it sort of changes the way that we think about that value and and money and the role of um the role of the authorities there as well in a sense but that's probably getting towards the ideology a bit too much um sorry no no i was just going to say uh, so obviously if if say for example uh the bitcoin uh industry was to suffer and needed something like quantitative easing it can't it physically cannot have something like quantitative easing to help it stabilize it is very it's volatile especially when it's backed by celebrities and uh people like elon musk for example now mm -hmm. we're recording this on the 17th of may sorry to obviously this is this is relevant greg don't worry i'm not i'm not breaking the fourth wall for you know no reason no i know <laughs> so yesterday obviously he tweeted and the stock absolutely plummeted and then it recovered and it's you know people I, th I think i read somewhere that someone they they were seeing liquidations of one and a half billion uh dollars worth of, of bitcoin i mean that's a huge amount of money to just be wiped mm -hmm. off if that was wiped off the stock exchange in a day there'd be there'd be panic yeah yeah this is the thing i, I mean this the whole thing now with elon musk and i'm personally um i try to sort of stay away from the sort of trader talk and things that tend to dominate the discussion but i think mm -hmm. it's really good in a way that it's waking people up especially within the crypto space to say that we're not really close to central like decentralization yet if the power of or the reputation or even a tweet from one man is capable of of doing that mm -hmm. um but that being said of course i think the volatility is expected as with any sort of new concept or something that's still sure. yet to kind of I guess flourish into its full form because mm -hmm. I think it's only really recently that Bitcoin and and crypto has kind of become almost a household name. I would say at least in in some circles. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I think that sort of bounce back is uh, is an important part because like the community and the people that are getting into crypto are very much in the belief that it doesn't really matter what happens; it's long term mm -hmm. going to work. And I think that's the the thing to sort of focus on here. I think it's quite popular in a lot of countries where that trust in centralised banking systems has failed and we're quite privileged in, in the UK, for, for example, not to have necessarily suffered that. But if you look at kind of hyperinflation in 1920s Germany or you look at kind of the situation in Latin American countries, there's a reason why cryptocurrencies are more popular in those places where there's been a failure of trust within the central system and the centralised system. And 
there's also an element i mean um i was having a chat with friend of the show sam mckelvey the other day um Uh, and he he pointed (laughs) me towards um a we were discussing this and he was saying that there's evidence supposedly by archaeologists that they found early kind of civilizations i think in polynesia or or maybe it was more towards the philippines um who used kind of stone coins that were considered uh they were used in an oral ledger so they were so big that they couldn't be moved and they couldn't be traded these are the type of things that could be the size of you know a massive cartwheel but made of stone and so the only way that you could trust the system is through the ledger of of people saying this is who owned this and mm-hmm. so the idea of a kind of communal ledger has actually been around in ancient societies um uh, like in an open source system so i wonder if if there's an element of that that's kind of the, the thing with blockchain i guess is as you said it's it's really hard to get your head around at first but it's very early days for cryptocurrencies and bitcoin is one of the things that almost gets maybe cryptocurrencies a bit of a bad reputation because it was the bit the big bad boy it's the first one but it's also by no means actually that technologically advanced compared to some of the things that are coming out now yeah i couldn't agree more and i think with that it's um like one thing I really enjoy in the space, like of course, Bitcoin could be that sort of entry point for a lot of people, but just because that's likely what they're going to hear about first. Mm-hmm. But one thing in in Web three in general is this idea that you sort of take what's there already, whether that's I don't know, looking at what the likes of Facebook or Google or other sort of companies have done, and not wanting to replicate that, but then also taking what is happening within that space, say with Bitcoin or other projects as well, and going well that's good in this this and this area but actually we need to improve on this area for example the environmental impact Uh, and of course then there's this very rapid um iteration process happening that's very it it sort of has that self-awareness within the space that people are like well if we're going to build something towards this future where we want people to really be celebrated or have some kind of agency over things in a different way then we need to make sure we're not just repeating those age-old problems that Mm -hmm. came before so i actually think there's this like by having this discussion having again more voices in that space you can kind of tackle those problems earlier and that Mm -hmm. can sort of lead into very interesting directions um i mean with nfts as well this is also that environmental impact for example has been a really big discussion over the last few months um there was an artist called Memo Atkin who released an article where he basically broke down the environmental impact of minting an NFT. And it was completely mind blowing. I think people Mm -hmm. hadn't really thought about it before. or They hadn't really, um, I guess, put two and two together to say, okay, crypto has this particular issue, but how does that come into this area? Because people don't intend to cause damage. No, so sure. when this was released, uh, when this was um, released, it was very much like, oh, what can we do about it? This is a huge, huge problem. Mm-hmm. And of course, more and more people coming into the space as well. So uh, since then, I, like almost immediately, people have been creating their solutions where there's something called green NFTs, which is um, obviously focused on an environmentally sound approach to minting NFTs. There's also um, different networks and technologies you can use that people are starting to explore more as well Um, and also you know for example waiting for ethereum to use proof of stake instead of proof of work and saying when that happens then i will actually put my artwork into this into this realm if you like so so we should sorry we should we should probably talk about why there's such a huge environmental impact and it takes it right back to the basis of cryptocurrency is the way that the the currency is created is by solving equations and so the the computers that are you know you you you're sure obviously the the people listening at home will have heard of mining farms um and they are basically huge numbers of you know gpu heavy computers which are uh, basically set to solve equations and earn coin by having a result verified by a process called hashing. Is that right? Yeah. 
So exactly. with the process that comes is a huge amount of power. It's obviously very, very intensive. You know, it's you're running every computer you own at full whack, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, and you have these huge great farms, which obviously taking up a huge amount of electricity. So I think that's quite a, quite a succinct explanation of why there's such a big environmental impact. Yeah, I hope. yeah, I, I definitely agree. And I think okay. also the um, the fact that a lot of the Bitcoin mining is dominated by, say, particular farms in China. Mm -hmm. Again, that's a discussion around is it really decentralized? But there's also the lack of knowledge around are they using green energy like that would be a pretty good solution but you can't really trace that or it's not very easy to find out what's really going on in those mining farms but then that being said there are alternative ways as well like proof of stake which instead of relying on that proof of work and computational um power mm -hmm. it would just be that you have skin just, in the sorry, game just, to, just explain that proof of work versus proof of stake sorry yeah, so, so proof of work is, um, as Tom described, that you are working on those computations to be able to um, to mine Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, whereas proof of stake is that you, you technically have skin in the game as, as a miner. So you have an incentive to, um, to sort of contribute to that. Uh, you have an incentive to contribute to it without it being, without it relying on that heavy computational demand. It's probably okay. not not the best uh, best explanation, but <laughs> hopefully that makes sense. Well, well, one thing that I kind of wanted to move the discussion on to is, is trying to see how blockchain is going to affect the photo industry. And obviously with your background at looking with digital art, uh, being a curator at the Museum of Contemporary Digital Art, and you mentioned before Kevin Abosh, um, uh, there's a lot of other kind of quite prominent uh, artists and photographers that are starting to get involved and I saw um, a thing in the um, uh, 1854 um, photographic was it British Journal of Photography that's what I'm thinking of uh, there was an article the other day about Adam Broomberg um, formerly of Broomberg and Channerin who had started to look at the idea of um, basically finding a way to embed identity of uh, subject into an image using blockchain technology and he was arguing that this is an incredibly disruptive kind of concept that could turn a lot of the photographic industry on its head because ultimately if you say if you, he he brought up the example of um, the green-eyed girl that S Steve McCurry photographed in Afghanistan you know that photo was sold for hundreds of thousands like prints of that photo mm -hmm. and the girl in the photo is never or the woman in the photo has never seen you know a sense of that and so he's talking about the concept of maybe embedding in facial recognition so that, you know, because with NFTs, one thing we haven't mentioned, but part of the appeal to them is that it was because of the way of cryptocurrency and, and blockchain technology, you can you can code into an NFT that every time it resells, there is a stake of that profit that goes back to the original original artist. So in a similar way, you could embed something that every time Steve McCurry's photo, the green-eyed girl, sold. She would effectively get a percentage of that. Well, that's a that's a basic concept. So, with that in mind, what other things have you seen that kind of show you the potential of what blockchain could mean for the industry in terms of different ways of creating and sharing money um, and the way these things are sold and et cetera, et cetera. Like what, because obviously there's so much that could potentially come from this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that first point you mentioned about like royalty payments or reset, reselling um, a photo and actually getting a portion of that where it's used, maybe it's not being resold, but even rented or printed somewhere else um, and redistributing parts of that profit back to the photographer or the subject, I think is already revolutionary it's not something that it for me it's actually quite surprising that that isn't something that already exists especially if it's to do with the subject or someone in the picture because surely that's what makes well obviously the photographer's eye but then the subject is what people are remembering as well especially in the example you used of the the girl from afghanistan um so i think that would be a great starting point for sure um and I think there's definitely a lot more nuance in terms of what that actually would look like in practice. 
Um, when you actually sort of invited me to this discussion, I was initially thinking of photography strictly as a form of kind of like fine arts, which maybe that's because of my history of art degree and things where I was like, okay, NFTs come in and solve those same kind of problems. But then actually, since thinking about it, I think actually the way photography is used online, especially, it's almost like a form of data in itself, because like you've you mentioned as well before, the sort of licensing around that image is mm -hmm. quite similar to how data is licensed in a way. And it's not really how people treat art in the same sense. Um, or maybe it's, I guess, an evolution of that, because photo photography has already gone through those rings, I guess, throughout the last 100 or 200 years now of being that emerging technology that needs to have um, needs to have a, a stance somewhere in that larger context. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that, well, the other thing as well with blockchain is just the use of smart contracts and automating a lot of that licensing. Um, I'm not sure, of course, on like the ins and outs of what that would look like in terms of an agreement between, say, a photographer and another institution. But I think if the photographer as the author could code in and basically set the permissions, you know, within embedded into the work itself, that could be mm -hmm. a really powerful move then for especially freelance photographers to be able to kind of have assertion over what happens to the image that they've created. Just to explain briefly what you mean by um, smart contracts or any kind of examples of smart contracts. Yeah, so a smart contract is basically uh, a self-executing contract. It would be something that is triggered when a particular action is taken. So again, mm -hmm. it comes back to the idea of not needing to rely on an intermediary because you, um, it's already... Oh, sorry, I'm having a bit of a... <laughs> so it's a bit <laughs> a like, bit okay, a... so at the moment, for example, you would perhaps you know you do a shoot for an editorial shoot for a magazine or something and then if a lot of celebrity or portrait photographers might then take their image to a stock library and license through that library mm -hmm. and traditionally with um that situation you know you're going to be getting a percentage of what they sell it for but it's probably weighted relatively evenly with most kind of um libraries at the moment so what you're saying is if you had a smart contract system, you might effectively be able to come up with a um, a licensing body that licensed your work, but because it was automated and used smart contracts, um, there is less reason for them to take such a high percentage and potentially it could be more profitable for the photographer. Mm. Yeah, exactly. That's a, That's definitely a good example. Um, and you can tra you can use other technology to track the use of images, I guess, as well, so that you could then really automate that to a point where it was just you didn't have to do anything, you know, like because at the moment you might occasionally run reverse image searches on your work to see whether or not there have been copyright infringes, and if you wanted to then do something about that, you would either have to kind of pursue it yourself or employ a third party that would would issue kind of a copyright takedown and potentially pursue it for financial gain. But most photographers I know probably don't really have the time to be doing that. So with with the smart contracts and the, obviously the kind of the licensing that can come with it, for example, that could be an amazing source of revenue for photographers because actually then we don't really have to do all the admin of tracing contracts and things like that because the, I think we can all agree the thing we least enjoy looking at is different contracts for different places if these places can go access our image and agree then to the terms of the image usage all automatically and then we be paid through no extra work that kind of sounds like the dream am i am I, I don't know that sounds that sounds great like getting getting money for very little work i mean don't get me wrong like i like working but this sounds great i thought you were going to say money for old rope then and i was going to chat I mean to chide honest, you for not describing your pictures as old rope. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're new rope. But traditionally, you know, the licensing of photos has been a revenue for photographers, but I and and it should be easier than ever. But I feel it's something that maybe lots of people that are coming into the industry and because of the way that digital world has developed, it's actually probably 
just as hard because actually you know you the number of times you might get your image reused on instagram without your permission or just put on a blog post without your permission um there's so many there's so much need for content now that images get used left right and center without any kind of monetization or or, or compensation to the photographer so mm -hmm. this potentially could solve those kind of issues yeah and i think that's not such a far-fetched idea um even where we stand now uh, I, I mean, my impression, although I'm no expert exactly on how this licensing looks for photographers, it seems as if the contracts and this model hasn't really up updated to match the digital world, or if it has, maybe not since the 90s or not with the sort of intensity that we have with the likes of like with social media and, and mm -hmm. other kind of tools. Um, and I think this could be a really good way to sort of align those um, I guess the incentives for the photographer, but also for the publishers and for everyone else involved. And I think that point you made, Greg, about the image being used all over the place, and it's actually really hard to track where that is. I think if you can do that in an automated way, and I guess go through that process of reclaiming that ownership over the image somehow without you needing to go through and have people power behind it, then you could really bring that authority back to the photographer in a way that at least you should be credited for the image in some of these whatever Instagram accounts or something. Um, and I, I don't really think it's such a, a far away concept. And it sort of su does surprise me that the idea of monetization in those structures doesn't already exist or that or isn't at the forefront of people's um, priority, I guess, because when you're when you're creating an image and you're putting all that work into making it, it shouldn't really be that you just have only a one one life cycle almost to mm. make that image what it is and then it's sort of gone into the ether and almost as if it's out of your hands mm. and i mean to, i guess one thing that's worth pointing out is this isn't that you know fantastical as an idea because it's already happening with there are music streaming services that are beginning to kind of get on board with this there was one i saw the other day called is it audius that are the idea being that they kind of distribute the they're almost like running in competition to things like Spotify and, and other existing uh, streaming services and trying to create a way that artists get a better percentage of revenue for their plays. Mm -hmm. um, and what was the other one that I... Which can only uh, be a good thing. Yeah. Because the, the streaming companies are, you know, for a politer term, they're not, they're not being massively friendly towards their artists that they're profiting quite highly from. Yeah, might yeah. be an unpopular view, but you know, I'd quite happily pay more if it meant that the artists got more. Well, that's the other thing. So, and I know this might be um, a similar. Stop me if I'm wrong, because I probably am. I often am. Um, <laughs> the the Brave browser is another similar kind of browser that's come with the concept of of, of data, and you know, you basically you get paid in what do they call them? Bats, which are mm -hmm. like basic uh attention what are they? tokens ba ba yeah sorry <laughs> i lost my attention there basic attention <laughs> tokens and you get paid for the fact that you are being fed adverts and so you can then use those bats to pay other websites so you could s use some bats to pay a website that you're reading news from and i wonder whether or not this kind of like different system in the term in the way that we're used to kind of um maybe uh, absorbing information so rather than expecting everything to be free or it to be behind a paywall subscription service maybe there's something in the middle where you actually say you know what i've read 15 articles this month from the new york times therefore i will pay a, you know i'll be pay a small amount each time rather than say last month when i didn't read any articles therefore i'm not paying anything versus paying a subscription which is a solid amount each time. And I guess the subscription model is probably better for certain businesses, but is the other model a bit fairer for the actual end user? And therefore, will there be uh, things that develop that start to use that as alternatives that mm -hmm. might become more popular? Because um, if that was the case, it could be the same for imagery. You know, imagery could be getting micropayments every time it's used, and that's not considered a, a massive issue by the person who's using it because they see it as fair use. But micropayments uh, you know multiplied by worldwide audience means more money yeah i think that idea of the the brave model being quite a good example because 
I think we're all used to seeing adverts and just accepting that that's an annoying thing that happens to be there and as if that's the only way it can be done. And I think what mm -hmm. Brave has done, which I find really interesting, is by actually giving people the option to earn from seeing the adverts, you're giving them another incentive to, yeah, give them your attention, basically. Whereas the rates of people installing ad blockers and things until now has just been on the on the rise. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they've actually kind of shown that like with the right sort of incentive, you can get people engaged in, t in that system in a way that they haven't been before. Uh, and mm. this is also something we're sort of doing with Swash as well, because it's like, if you sort of rethink those models and, and focus on that incentivization mechanic, you you can kind of come up with ways that work for everyone. And I think mm -hmm. what you're describing there with actual image use as well, until now, I would say the photographer or the author, if you like, has been sort of left to the bottom of the pile in terms of priorities of, or having a sort of say over what happens, because I guess you can be quite easy to be dominated by publishers or larger corporations that mm -hmm. we're content makers have... in inverted commas so mm -hmm. yeah you know, it's always <laughs> going to be exploited by middlemen or, or you know kind of companies that you seek to monetize that mm -hmm. yeah and i think like if i wouldn't say the monetization part of it would be bad but it's just about making sure that that's fairly sort of distributed within the ecosystem so when you're saying mm -hmm. like for example that if you've earned bat tokens or other crypto for example, and you want to then pay a content creator, maybe you, as a user, you would have more uh, incentive to pay that particular um, content creator once you've also earned that those tokens for doing something that you didn't, you know, pay out of your pocket for, if that makes mm. sense. So it's almost yeah. like, for example, by reading the article or as you read this news article and you fill in a survey or you've given your attention to an advert at the same time, you can use that money to send back to the people who wrote the article or contributed with the photo or whatever the case. So it has that kind of action um, and fluidity within that model that we haven't really seen until now. And I think, yeah, blockchain is a really good way to make that happen because it allows for micropayments to exist. And until now, I mean, if you're trying to do that through a bank, it would just be a very slow and clunky and probably pretty expensive process to go through. And mm -hmm. if that's all just happening in the background, I'd say it's quite a win-win for everyone because you, especially as a photographer or as the reader or whoever you are, you're sort of participating in that model without really having to change the behavior that you already have adopted or that you already use. Hmm. So, okay, to take this back briefly to nfts um obviously this is something that has has as you said it's kind of emerged in the last couple of years but it's it's probably hit most mainstream people's kind of attention earlier this year with the you know a couple of quite big sales and kind of um situations that really you know were um were just explosive um but there seems to be a lot of mystery still about uh, NFTs and what actually they are. So, you know, I was chatting to someone the other day and they were talking about the, you know, the idea that, well, the NFT is obviously for the metaverse. And I, I was like, I'm, I'm sorry, what, what's the metaverse? <laughs> and, you know, it's, and then understanding that actually there are virtual worlds that people spend a lot of time in um, and that someone was saying to me yeah I'd, I'd love to get some of your images because I've got a virtual gallery and I wanted to um, put some of them in there and sell them and because I was like well so, someone's going to have them on their virtual wall in the metaverse how does that work <laughs> so can you I mean what's the big idea with NFTs basically <laughs> and what does it mean like if I buy an NFT do I I know I'm, I know it's a very grey area but do I own the copyright what do I actually have what's tangible so tan tangible being a sort of question mark web there, um, but <laughs> as someone who, who, if you own the NFT, you you have the certificate of ownership of that NFT, for example. I, in yeah. terms of copyright, like I'm not a lawyer, but as I understand in its current form now, the copyright would still belong to the author, so the artist that created that NFT. Uh, so if you're the photographer, you would still retain that copyright unless otherwise specified but somehow. That's... Yeah, okay. That hasn't had a test case, I guess, yet. 
No, I don't think. And it, it has might yet. change. In, would it be so universal, buying... or would it change in different jurisdictions as well? I, that's something that's under discussion now. I think they're talking about whether NFTs would be classed as a kind of security, like they can be as collateral, for example, they could be bought, sold, gifted, whatever. So where actually does it sit? And and I mean, you could look at it in the same way as how art is being looked at already, which is sort of like as an asset. Um, but even then, I think there's still a lot of question marks because not every NFT is art, for example. It could be a tweet and that sure. just gets into a really complicated discussion really quickly. So um, is it yeah. is it effectively like buying a non-exclusive transferable license? Sorry to use photographer talk. But because if you don't own the copyright, and then you can obviously sell the NFT onwards. And the is there what was stopping the creator from creating another NFT of that photograph? I don't think anything would be stopping them necessarily. I think until now that hasn't been something that's been at the forefront of the discussion, which sure. definitely needs to be. And I think also there's that the other side of it where if a artist, for example, wants to use a I don't know, a picture of Mickey Mouse or something. Where is that line of use of the image and copyright and other mm. or logos, for example? But mm. then again, that's also been a really tough discussion in art too. And, you know, postmodernism and the idea of like using pop art. Yeah, I mean, and... Andy Warhol. Exactly. Oh, he'd be exactly. sued by Campbell's. <laughs> yeah, you would have thought like that. But that's a, you could kind of argue it either way in that, in that case. Yeah. Um, I, but then I in guess, terms... sorry, no, go on. No, no, I was just thinking like in terms of like the tangibility of it, the a lot of people are just really excited about having that ownership of it. So say, for example, you had an NFT of this particular photograph and it's been bought and sold and loaned or whatever. You still have on the ledger that that existed before the replica photograph. So that would still give That's you true. a certain amount of authority, I guess, over the what would happen to the other one as well because it's mm. already proof that existed before and this technically exists in the art world anyway i can't remember what it's called but i watched a fascinating documentary about a gallery in america that was part it was selling on faked artworks and they all have is it oh, i can't remember what it's it's basically proof of authenticity and it's a it's a ledger of effectively who the owners and the sale dates so it's effectively that but in a digital form yeah, well, there's even artworks about that history of ownership. And I think Hans mm. Hacker was, uh, he did a exhibition where he included, I can't remember what the work is called, but he basically had the, like the provenance and ownership of a particular work, which was, I think it was looted by the Nazis. And then the, the way the gallery had obtained it was sort of very, not the most savory approach and obviously related to kind of Nazi Germany and all of that history. And he kind of showcased all of that through this documentation. Um, but I mean, yeah, even to this day, like when it comes to art or, or photography, I'm sure in a lot of ways, it's quite hard to really pin down who that author was, maybe less so now with photography, especially, but I think for artists, there's always this discussion of, was it really Michelangelo that painted it or, if Providence. Damien Hurst's whole workshop created it and he just put his name on it, does that count, really? Um, mm. But yeah, the provenance is a huge discussion. And I think, like, if you... Like, it's the same it? as, a, you know, in, in a photography world, traditionally it would be a signed print, you know, and mm -hmm. you would have uh, an edition number on that. And, you know, in the photography art world, not necessarily the whole photography world, but um, I heard recently there was, a, there was a printing company that was looking to find ways to actually print the nft data into an image like embed it into an image so that you could effectively send that image anywhere in the world and if they had access to that particular type of printer they could print their own physical version but with wow. the nft embedded mm -hmm. which i think again is a bit of a game changer for decentralizing from even galleries because i guess the only thing is that galleries ultimately are, are a form of representation but also traditionally they have been gatekeepers to to the industry and i don't know i'm interested obviously for for listeners who've not will link to this but you mentioned him very briefly at the beginning but kevin abosh um who did i am a coin um he originally 
kind of rose well not originally rose to fame but he rose to fame in about 2010 famously for this potato that sold for one million a picture of a potato that sold for one million pounds or one million euros um he's an irish american artist living in new york and the i am a coin he's he basically was about the idea of commodify com- i'm gonna mark this up what's the term <laughs> commodification like self- yes like self-commodification i think cause for, like, yes. specifically of like, so he, the artist's yeah, so t- just explain to, to the listeners what he did with that particular work. So basically, he es- essentially he tokenized himself. Um, he so this like, is so he, meta. Yeah, well, he used his blood to print a contract address, which was linked to the token that represented him. Um, I mean, it, it's. To be honest, it's even evolved quite a lot since 2018, I'd say, like in terms of how that's being used. So, but that for me was sort of the entry point. And I think he, the message behind it was about his attachment as the kind of human being or the creator being the reason why that particular piece would sell, of like the name being associated with the artwork, maybe more so than the artwork itself. And I think also the potato was sort of a, a bit of a tongue in cheek prod at that that kind of narrative that tends to dominate um mm. but yeah kevin which Abosh's... has been that concept has been around you know for for years anyway hasn't it it's that um we discussed this before but the duchamp toilet mm-hmm. you know he signed it signed a urinal and then it became art um and and that was pointing you know making making a kind of an example of of how this this kind of world can work I think that's a really interesting point that actually sort of takes me in a in another direction too that nfts seem to be a really good gateway for i guess non-conventional artists to enter the art world and be classified as art with a capital a um Mm. because i guess until now we tend to see that the likes of graphic designers or game design um you know all of even photography maybe to a point has always sort of been on the fringes and not really been allowed to call itself art in the same way that paint on a canvas has been considered art for centuries Mm. and now with nfts the the artists that are really flourishing within this space are the ones who for example bring in animation or they have these sort of 3d rendering or other kind of um design skills that they've brought into that particular piece because Mm. i guess in in that sense the nft well, the NFT is something which, if you can kind of celebrate it in its digital form as something which yes. is not possible to have outside of this digital realm, like I guess coming back to what you're saying about the metaverse too, that mm, almost gives it like an extra... Which is also where Mopta comes into this as well. You know, the fact that you're working with a museum of contemporary digital art and the mm. only way of displaying a lot of that is on a screen because, or for now anyway yeah. until we all wear virtual reality headsets yeah. <laughs> and yeah, well, we, dive headfirst into the metaverse yeah which i'm very excited for the more of that the better in my opinion um but i think also the <laughs> other thing with um like even with mokta we have limited edition prints of digital works as well and that is kind of i guess that bridge between the sort of physical and the digital worlds and how you can if you for example own a particular digital work but you still want to showcase it in your home somehow and you're not really happy with a mm. TV screen doing it for you, then you can still print them out and have like a signed edition if you if you sort of want that artist touch um, there as well. But I should add that with Mokta, it's looking at digital art as a whole genre, which is like the umbrella of that particular... Well, that genre has been around since at least the 1950s, if not a bit longer. So we're sort of looking Mm. at all of the genres within that, um, whether it's net art or generative art and so on. And NFTs slash crypto art just happen to be one of those particular genres and arguably the one which has really got the attention of digital art into the sort of mainstream discussion, Um, which has always surprised me because even when I was studying, I was thinking we're, we're living in this really connected world using the internet every day. And yet the actual I guess the sort of genre or the focus of artists who use that as their primary medium have always sort of been pushed to the side and not really at the forefront of um, 
whether it's like exhibitions or gallery attention mm. and in a way i think nfts have sort of subverted that that a lot of galleries and you know the likes of christie's and sotheby's now are really trying to get in on this new wave of uh whatever nfts are and whatever they will be to sort of look maybe to look relevant or to look like they're still within that space but i think there's been a little bit of a misunderstanding about where it actually sits in this broader context as well i mean i could mm go into a little bit of a rant now just in terms of the curatorial side of uh, the latest Christie's and CryptoPunks um, <laughs> sale that happened. It was just a really bizarre way of presenting CryptoPunks, I think, but that's that's something that I recommend people But as you into. said, it's, it's <laughs> yeah, it's early days and they're probably, st everyone's still trying to figure it all out and those big hitters in those in those the auctioning world kind of want to be involved because they're probably afraid of what it means for them as a mm. institution if they don't get involved now and, and you know was it kind of like your great grandparents doing a tiktok dance <laughs> i imagine probably it to be like to that awkward <laughs> yeah and i think or that's just us doing a tiktok or just dance us doing it. yeah fine <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> but i guess also that's interesting that in a way the the artists and the collectors of NFTs in this in this example are the ones that dictated that. It wasn't that Christie's and Sotheby's or any other gallery dictated that this was the next big thing. It's like they mm. sort of had to scramble a little to to keep up with what the actual trend is and what people want. And of course, that sort of reminds us of you know the impressionists and the early modernist period where you have um, more traditional galleries were refusing to exhibit the you know, the likes of Manet. And then mm. the actual public were showing a really clear interest in what was happening there. And eventually, you know, they catch up and, and start exhibiting them and saying, okay, this is art now, finally. That's a really good example, actually. Yeah, it's a really good way of explaining it as well. I guess, so to for, as our kind of, t uh, you know, tying it up kind of takeaways, I think the the real thing here is that, you know, NFTs aside, blockchain is you know very early days but it has a lot of potential and as of yet we're kind of still figuring out exactly what that will mean but for the photo industry alone it could have major implications down the line and how how quickly do you think those kind of things happen and those things change because it will be within our lifetime that's the thing at the end of the day um, and the the pace of change, do you feel like it's accelerating as more and more people come on board? Do you think that the publicity of NFTs has probably helped the wider cause of people getting involved and interested in blockchain? Yeah, I think the, like, interestingly, the NFTs have been the thing that have got people involved. I would have thought Bitcoin or, or something else could have really grabbed that attention of a more mainstream audience. Um, I'm not against it at all. Uh, I think we do have to be careful not to... Um, assume that the existence of NFTs solves all of the problems in, in whatever industry, because there is still a lot of development needed and things need to kind of evolve before that could happen. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to say that it just shows people that there are another way of, that another way of doing things exists and like different, mm. whether it's power structures or monetization models or, or agency over work in, in different ways. It's something where it's like, this is a reality that we can change to suit us. It doesn't have to just be how it has been before. Um, and yeah, that being said, I think when you have more perspectives in the discussion, then whether it's artists, photographers, or lawyers, or whoever else, then you can really advance that technology in a way that you don't always see that in other areas. And it mm. can help you sort of nip problems in the bud before they evolve into something bigger. Mm -hmm. And I think actually even with blockchain, it's only in the last few years where it hasn't just been dominated by very technical voices and so nothing nothing against very technical people but i think it can be a bit exclusionary for other people who don't know what those words mean or don't code or whatever the case and it can make it hard to have those discussions and say like you know how is it going to be for people from that sort of you know, more sort of everyday user point of view. And that, that's something with Swash too that we were sort of focused on is because it's it's like a front facing application and thinking about actually how people are going to perceive this and how are they going to interact with it is, is still quite new, even in the sort of blockchain 
space as a whole, let alone with NFTs and all of the complications behind that. Mm, um, mm. But then, yeah, I definitely think it will accelerate very quickly. Maybe it's already happening as we're discussing potential applications for photography licensing and, and other ideas. It could be happening already. And, and like I said, the technology is there for it. It doesn't need to advance so much for that to be possible. Um, I, I guess questions around AI and tracing, well, I'm no expert on that, but I, I don't doubt that there's already very sort of practical use cases that people are exploring, maybe away from blockchain, that could be helped or advanced by um, by this technology or this sort of collaborative effort to move in that direction, at least. Mm. Amazing. Well, that's, I mean, I think that covers a lot of what we wanted to talk about. And, you know, thank you so much for coming on. Obviously, before you go, we have our final questions that we always have to ask you. Um, so I hope you've given it some thought, which is your Desert Island camera and your Desert Island photo book. So what would you be taking in your non-metaverse Desert Island that we're going to send you to? <laughs> well, if it has to be non-metaverse, I would go as analog <laughs> as possible and go for something like a Leica 1, like Rodchenko style. Um, wow. Obviously, you'd need some kind of dark room, I guess, for that. Oh, one. There, there, yeah, is there, there is a oh, lab. There is a lab, yeah. lab. Okay, yep. that's good. That, that's good to know. I quite, I quite like the idea of having time to go through the development process. Um, and did, and in terms of a photo book, um, I'm quite into, I guess, like sort of circa 1950s. So maybe Elliot Erwitt or Cecil Beaton Ooh. or something like that. Any any choice of the Elliot Erwitt? Did you ever see his, his book on dogs was always quite I amusing, would, but he's... I, yeah, I would go for the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> just need something to cheer you up when you're alone on a desert island and there's probably not many dogs there too so why not no just monkeys and coconuts <laughs> um well thank you so much for um taking the time to come on today Chloe. absolutely it was a really thank interesting you. chat and um we will put links to um the swash app so that people can kind of find out a bit more about that and um links to everything else that you've discussed as much as we can in the show notes so once again, thank you very much for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. Hey, no worries. Thank you. Hey, guys, and thank you so much for listening to the latest episode. If you'd like to stay in touch, there are a number of options for you to uh, reach out. We can be emailed um, at info at exposednegative.com and you can find us on the website at exposednegative.com or on Instagram at xnegative. We're pretty good at responding to DMs on there. And we're also on Twitter at exposednegative. You can find us personally on our own private accounts on Instagram. Uh, Tom is tombarnes.com and I am just Greg Fennell. Cheers. Thanks for listening.